Expiation. You shall make his soul an offering for sin. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10. Both Jews and Gentiles knew pretty well what an offering for sin meant. The Gentiles had been in the habit of offering sacrifices. The Jews, however, had by far the clearer idea of it. And what was meant by a sin offering? Undoubtedly it was taken for granted by the offer that without shedding blood there was no remission of sin. Conscious of guilt and anxious for pardon, he therefore brought a sacrifice, the blood of which should be poured out at the foot of the altar. He was persuaded that without sacrifice there was no satisfaction and without satisfaction there was no pardon. Then the victim to be offered was, on all occasions, a spotless one. The most scrupulous care was taken that it should be altogether without blemish for this idea was always connected with a sin offering that it must be sinless in itself. And being without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, it was held to be a competent victim to take the offender's place. That done, the victim being selected, the offerer put his hand upon the sin offering and this, indeed, was the essence of the whole transaction putting his hand on the victim he confessed his sin and a transference took place, in type at least, from the offender to the victim. He did, as it were, put the sin from off his own shoulders on to those of the lamb, or the bullock, or the male goat which was now about to be slaughtered. And, to complete the sin offering, the priest draws his knife and kills the victim which must be utterly consumed with fire. I say this was always the idea of a sin offering that of a perfect victim, without offense on its own account taking the place of the offender, the transference of the offender's sin to the victim, and the expiation in the person of the victim for the sin done. Now, Jesus Christ has been made by God an offering for sin and oh that tonight we may be able to do in reality what the Jew did in metaphor. May we put our hand upon the head of Christ Jesus and as we see him offered up upon the cross for guilty men, may we know that our sins are transferred to him and may we be able to cry, in the ecstasy of faith, Great God, I am clean. Through Jesus' blood I am clean. In trying, now, to expound the doctrine of Christ's being an offering for sin, we will begin by laying down one great axiom, which is, that sin deserves and demands punishment. Certain divines have objected to this. You are aware, I suppose, that there have been many theories of atonement and every new or different theory involves a new or different theory of sin. There are some who say that there is no reason in sin itself why it should be punished, but that God punishes offenses for the sake of society at large. This is what is called the governmental theory that it is necessary for the maintenance of good order that an offender should be punished but that there is nothing in sin itself which absolutely requires a penalty. Now we begin by opposing all this and asserting, and we believe we have God's warrant of it, that sin intrinsically and in itself demands and deserves the just anger of God and that that anger should be displayed in the form of a punishment. To establish this, let me appeal to the conscience I will not say to the conscience of a man who has, by years of sin, dwindled it down to the very lowest degree. But let me appeal to the conscience of an awakened sinner, a sinner under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And are we ever in our right senses, brothers and sisters, till the Holy Spirit really brings us into them? May it not be said of each of us as it was of the prodigal he came to himself? Are we not beside ourselves till the Holy Spirit begins to enlighten us? Well, ask this man, who is now really in the possession of his true senses, whether he believes that sin deserves punishment and his answer will be quick, sharp and decisive deserve it, says he, yes, indeed. And the wonder is that I have not suffered it. Why, sir, it seems a marvel to me that I am out of hell and Wesley's. Tell it unto sinners, tell. I am, I am out of hell. Yes, sir, says such a sinner, I feel that if God should strike me now, without hope or offer of mercy, to the lowest hell, I should only have what I justly deserve. And I feel that if I am not punished for my sins, or if there is not some plan found by which my sin can be punished in another, I cannot understand how God can be just at all. How shall he be the judge of all the earth if he suffers offenses to go unpunished? There has been a dispute whether men have any innate ideas, but surely this idea is in us as early as anything that virtue deserves reward and sin deserves punishment. 
I think I might venture to assert that if you go to the most degraded race of men you would still find, at least, some traces of this shall I call it traditioner is it not a part of the natural light which never was altogether eclipsed in man. Man may put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, darkness for light and light for darkness, but this follows him as a dog at the heels of its mastura sense that virtue should be rewarded and that sin must be punished. You may stifle this voice, if you will, but sometimes you will hear it and terribly and decisively will it speak in your ears to say to you, yes, man, God must punish you. The judge of all the earth cannot suffer you to go scot-free. Add to this another matter, namely, that God has absolutely declared his displeasure against sin itself. There is a passage in Jeremiah, the 44th chapter and the 4th verse, where he calls it, that abominable thing which I hate. And then, in Deuteronomy, the 25th chapter, at the 16th verse, he speaks of it as the thing which is an abomination to him. It must be the character of God that he has a desire to do towards his creatures that which is equitable. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? If there is anything in them which deserves reward, rest assured he will not rob them of it. And, on the other hand, he will do the right thing with those who have offended if they deserve punishment it is according to the nature and character of a just and holy God that punishment should be inflicted. And we think there is nothing more clear in Scripture than the truth that sin is in itself so detestable to God that he must and will put forth all the vigor of his tremendous strength to crush it and to make the offender feel that it is an evil and a bitter thing to offend against the Most High. Beware, you who forget God in this matter, lest he tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver you. Sin must be punished. The other idea that sin is only to be punished for the sake of the community involves injustice. If I am to be damned for the sake of other people, I object to it. No, sir, if I am to be punished, justice says, at any rate, that it shall be for my own sins. But if I am to be eternally a castaway from God's presence merely as a sort of trick of government to maintain the dignity of his law, I cannot understand the justice of this. If I am to be cast into hell merely that I am to teach to others the tremendousness of the divine holiness, I shall say there is no justice in this. But if my sin intrinsically and of itself deserves the wrath of God and I am sent to perdition as the result of this fact, I close my lips and have nothing to say. I am speechless. Conscience binds my tongue. But if I am told that I am only sent there as a part of a scheme of moral government, and that I am sent into torment to impress others with a sense of right, I ask that someone else should have the place of preacher to the people and that I may be one of those whose felicity it shall be to be preached to for I see no reason in justice why I should be selected as the victim. Really, when men run away from the simplicities of the gospel in order to make Jehovah more kind, it is strange how unjust and unkind they make him. Sinner, God will never destroy you merely to maintain his government, or for the good of others. If you are destroyed, it shall be because you would not come to him that you might have life. Because you would rebel against him. Because sin from stern necessity did, as it were, compel the attribute of divine justice to kindle into vengeance and to drive you from his presence forever. Sin must be punished. The reverse of this doctrine that sin demands punishment may be used to prove it, for it is highly immoral, dangerous, and opens the floodgates of licentiousness to teach that sin can go unpunished. Oh sirs, it is contrary to fact. Look! Oh, if your eyes could see, tonight, the terrible justice of God which is being executed know if these ears could but hear it if you could be appalled for a moment with the sullen groans and hollow moans and shrieks of tortured ghosts. You would soon perceive that God is punishing sin. And if sin deserves not to be punished, what is hell but injustice on a monstrous scale? What is it but an infinite outrage against everything which is honest and right, if these creatures are punished for anything short of their own deeds? Go and preach this in hell and you will have quenched the fire which is forever to burn and the worm of conscience will die. Tell them in hell that they are not punished for sin and you have taken away the very sting of their punishment. And then come to earth and go, 
like Jonah went though with another message than Jonah carried through the highways and the broadways, the streets and thoroughfares of this exceeding great city and proclaim that sin is not to be punished for its own intrinsic desert and baseness. But if you expect your prophecy to be believed, enlarge the number of your jails and seek for fresh fields for transportation in the interests of society, for if any doctrine can breed villains this will. Say that sin is not to be punished and you have unhinged government you have plucked up the very gate of our common prosperity. You will have been another Samson to another Gaza and we shall soon have to rue the day. But, sirs, I need not stop to prove it. It is written clearly upon the consciousness of each man and upon the conscience of every one of us, that sin must be punished. Here are you and I tonight brought into this dilemma. We have sinned. We all, like sheep, have gone astray and we must be punished for it. It is impossible, absolutely, that sin can be forgiven without a sacrifice. God